Welcome to the Saving Castles podcast, the sanctuary for castle devotees and medieval history enthusiasts. Prepare to embark on a thrilling voyage through time as we unveil enthralling history and legend. From ancient folklore to cutting-edge restoration, we've got it all covered. So grab your headphones and let's dive right in. Welcome, dear listeners, to a journey unlike any other, a voyage through time's dense fabric to the heart of medieval England. This is not merely a passage through history, but a venture into a world as complex as it is distant. Imagine, if you will, the mists of the early morning parting to reveal the silhouetted spires of a cathedral, the distant clang of the blacksmith's hammer, or the solemn procession of monks through cloistered walkways. Here, in this era of profound faith and fierce feuds, we embark on an exploration that transcends the boundaries of time to uncover the essence of life in a period marked by stark contrasts of light and shadow, piety and power, festivity and famine, our odyssey commences in the shadow of towering fortresses, the medieval castles that stand as sentinels over the rolling English countryside. These stone behemoths were far more than mere military bastions. They were the epicenters of medieval society, the seats of power from which the realm was ruled. Within their thick walls and beneath their soaring battlements, the drama of medieval life unfolded. The great hall, with its vaulted ceilings and grand fireplaces, bore witness to opulent feasts where lords and ladies gathered in a spectacle of wealth and prestige, while deep in the dungeons below, whispered secrets and the clanking of chains spoke of darker tales. But to truly grasp the essence of medieval England, one must venture beyond these castles to the vibrant tapestry of village life. Here, amidst the green fields and along the meandering streams, the heart of England beats strongest. Picture the medieval village, awash with the sounds of daily life, the rhythmic thud of the miller at work, the chatter of peasants in the fields, and the laughter of children playing in the dirt lanes. These communities were the backbone of medieval society, bound together by the cycles of the seasons, planting and harvest life and death, each person playing a role in the delicate balance of feudal life. Yet it was not just earthly concerns that defined the medieval world. The church stood as a pillar of society, a beacon of spiritual guidance amid the tumult of temporal light. Imagine the awe-inspiring cathedrals and humble parish churches that dotted the landscape, their spires reaching heavenward as if to draw down divine grace. Within these hallowed walls the air vibrated with the chant of liturgy, the scent of incense, and the fervent prayers of the faithful seeking salvation or solace. The church was a source of both comfort and conflict, wielding immense power that shaped the destinies of kings and commoners alike. And what of chivalry, that most romanticized aspect of medieval life? Our journey takes us into the heart of the tournament, where knights clad in shining armor jousted for honor and glory. But this age of chivalry was also an era of conflict, where the ideals of knightly virtue were tested in the crucible of war. The clash of swords and the thunder of cavalry charges echoed across battlefields where history was written in blood, and the fate of nations was decided. Yet, amid the strife and struggle, the human spirit yearned for expression, for beauty that transcended the mundane. This was the age that witnessed the flowering of Gothic architecture, where cathedrals soared skyward with a grace that seemed to defy the very stone from which they were carved. It was a time of artistic endeavor, where the illuminated manuscript brought learning and scripture to life in a riot of color and gold. In every carved column and painted panel, the medieval world sought to touch the divine. But darkness lurked, too, in the form of the Black Death, a shadow that swept across the land with merciless fury. This plague, this grim reaper, reshaped society in ways unimaginable, leaving behind a world irrevocably altered. 
Yet even in the face of such devastation, life persisted, adapted, and evolved. Our journey through medieval England is also a celebration of the human spirit, of resilience and creativity. It is a tale of feasts and festivals, of May Day dances and Yuletide revels, where the harshness of daily life was momentarily forgotten in the joy of the moment. Through these celebrations, the medieval world affirmed life, community, and the enduring cycle of the seasons. So, dear listeners, prepare yourselves. You are about to embark on a voyage to a land both strange and familiar, a realm of knights and peasants, of castles and cathedrals, of beauty and despair. This is your guide to the sights, sounds, and sensations of medieval England, a world long past yet forever woven into the fabric of our history. In the tapestry of medieval life, the castle stands as a formidable thread, weaving tales of power, protection, and prestige. These stone giants, rooted in the very essence of medieval England, rise from the bed and landscape like mountains of human ambition and architectural mastery. The castle, with its towering walls and deep moats, was not merely a residence, but a statement a declaration of dominion over land and subject, a symbol of authority that was both seen and felt across the realm. Our journey into the majesty of the medieval castle begins at the drawbridge, a gateway between worlds. Here the air hangs heavy with anticipation, for to cross this threshold is to step into a realm governed by the laws of feudal hierarchy and knightly honour. Beyond lies the bailey, bustling with life and activity, where the daily rhythms of the castle unfold. Artisans ply their trades, soldiers drill with discipline, and servants scurry with purpose, each playing their part in the intricate dance of castle life. The heart of the castle, the great hall, looms before us, its grandeur undiminished by the passage of time. Vaulted ceilings soar overhead, supported by columns that speak of strength and stability. Here, the Lord presides over his domain, seated upon the dais as the embodiment of power and authority. The great hall is a stage for diplomacy and celebration, where feasts are held under the glow of torchlight, and the air resounds with music, laughter, and the clinking of goblets. It is in these moments of revelry that the bonds of fealty are reinforced, binding lord and vassal in mutual obligation and respect. Yet the castle's majesty is not confined to its halls and chambers. Venture to the battlements, and you will find a world of stern vigilance and martial prowess. Here, sentinels keep watch over the surrounding lands, their eyes sharp for any sign of threat. The walls, thick and imposing, bear the scars of siege and battle, silent testament to the castle's role as a bastion of defence. From these heights, archers and crossbowmen could rain down arrows upon attackers, while cauldrons of boiling oil stood ready to repel those who dared to breach the gates. Beneath the castle's stern façade lies a network of chambers and passageways, each with its own story to tell. The chapel, bathed in the soft light of stained glass, offers a haven of peace and piety, where the Lord and his household might seek divine favour and solace. In contrast, the armoury clangs with the sound of metal, a constant reminder of the ever-present threat of war. Here weapons and armour are meticulously maintained, for the knight's strength lies as much in his steel as in his spirit. But let us not forget the dungeons, those shadowy recesses where the castle's mysteries deepen. Here, in the damp and the dark, the fate of prisoners and traitors is sealed away from the light of day. The dungeon is a place of whispers and secrets, of plots woven in silence and desperation. It is a reminder of the medieval world's harsher realities where mercy could be as scarce as freedom. The medieval castle, however, was more than just a fortress of stone and mortar. It was a microcosm of society itself. Within its walls, the full spectrum of medieval life unfolded, from the highest nobility to the lowest servant. 
Each person, regardless of station, played a role in the castle's daily drama, contributing to the tapestry of communal life that was as vibrant as it was varied. As night falls, the castle transforms. The walls, bathed in moonlight, take on an ethereal quality, as if the very stones whisper tales of ages past. In the great hall, the embers of the hearth cast dancing shadows, while outside, the world sleeps under the castle's watchful gaze. It is in these quiet moments that one can truly feel the weight of history, the presence of those who walked these halls, fought upon these battlements, and lived out their lives within these walls. Thus the medieval castle stands as a testament to human ingenuity and ambition, a monument to the complexities of medieval society. It is a place where power was wielded, alliances forged, and destinies shaped by the sword and the word. In exploring its depths and heights, we uncover not just the stones and timbers of its construction, but the very essence of the medieval soul, resilient, enduring, and forever reaching toward the unattainable. Beneath the shadow of the castle, woven into the lush fabric of the English countryside, lies the medieval village, the heartbeat of a bygone era. This is where the tapestry of life is most vibrant, a microcosm of society pulsating with the rhythms of rural existence. Here, in the fields and upon the commons, the soul of medieval England finds its most profound expression. As dawn breaks, the village awakens to the crow of the rooster and the tolling of the church bell calling all to the day's toil. Peasants, bound to the land by the chains of serfdom, make their way to the fields, tools in hand, ready to sow the seeds that will feed a nation. The air is filled with the scent of earth and the promise of harvest, as the cycle of the seasons dictates the rhythm of life. In the heart of the village, the commons buzz with activity. Here, the communal oven bakes the daily bread, a staple of the medieval diet, while the mill grinds the grain, its wheels turned by the relentless flow of the stream. The blacksmith's forge glows with the heat of creation, as iron is transformed into tools and plowshares, the sinews of agriculture and war. But the medieval village is more than just a place of labor. It is a community woven together by bonds of kinship and obligation. The manor house, home to the lord of the village, stands as a reminder of the feudal hierarchy that structures every aspect of village life. Yet, despite the weight of feudal oppression, the village is a place of cooperation and mutual support. Barn raising and harvest festivals bring together young and old, noble and serf, in celebrations that transcend social divisions, if only for a moment. The village green is the stage upon which the drama of communal life unfolds. Here, markets are held where goods are traded and gossip shared, weaving the social fabric tighter with each transaction and tale. It is also a place of judgment, where the stock stands as a stark reminder of the consequences of transgression and disputes are settled under the watchful eye of the village elders. Yet, the medieval village is not an ideal of peace and harmony. It is a place where life is precarious, and hardship is never more than a failed crop or a lord's whim away. Disease and famine cast long shadows over the village, and the spectre of war looms ever-present, ready to call away fathers and sons to fight in distant battles. In the midst of this struggle, the church stands as a beacon of hope and salvation, the parish priest, a figure of spiritual authority and moral guidance, administers the sacraments and keeps the calendar of saints' days and holy festivals, marking the passage of time with feasts and fasts. The church is both the soul of the village and its centre, where the milestones of life, birth, marriage, death, are sanctified, binding the community together in a shared faith that offers solace in the face of suffering. As night falls, the village retreats into the warmth of hearth and home. Stories are told by firelight, tales of saints and heroes, of monsters and miracles, that connect the villagers to a world beyond their own, a realm of imagination and belief that offers escape from the rigors of daily life.
In these stories, the medieval village finds its voice, a narrative of resilience and endurance that weaves through the generations, a thread of continuity in a changing world. Thus, the medieval village emerges as a tapestry of life, a complex interweaving of human endeavour, social structure and cultural belief. It is a place where the land shapes the people, and the people, in turn, leave their mark upon the land. In exploring its fields and lanes, its homes and hearths, we discover not just the material conditions of medieval life, but the spirit of an age that, though long past, continues to enchant and inspire. In the tapestry of medieval life, the church stands as a colossus, its spires piercing the heavens, a tangible manifestation of the divine on earth. This is not merely an institution, but the very heartbeat of medieval spirituality. The medieval church, in its grandeur and humility, serves as the axis upon which the medieval world turns, a beacon of faith, piety, and communal unity in an age of tumult and transformation. As the dawn breaks, the bells toll, their sonorous peals calling the faithful to prayer, a daily ritual that frames the existence of every man, woman, and child. From the majestic cathedrals that dominate the skylines of cities to the modest parish churches, nestled in the heart of rural villages, the church is omnipresent, a constant in the lives of the medieval populace. Here, in these sacred spaces, the mysteries of faith are unveiled. The stories of saints and sinners alike are told in stained glass and stone. The power of the medieval church extends far beyond the spiritual realm, wielding considerable influence over the social, political, and cultural life of the time. It is a power enshrined in the very fabric of society, where bishops hold sway as both spiritual leaders and temporal lords, and the church's wealth is evident in the opulence of its edifices and the extent of its lands. Yet this power is not unchallenged. As the church navigates the delicate dance of authority with the crown, a relationship fraught with tension and negotiation, each seeking to assert its primacy over the hearts and minds of the people. In the shadow of the church's might, the monastic communities offer a counterpoint, a world apart dedicated to the pursuit of spiritual perfection through prayer, contemplation, and labor. The monasteries and convents stand as islands of tranquility in a turbulent sea, centers of learning and scholarship where the sacred texts are preserved, copied, and studied, here, the monks and nuns lead lives of asceticism and devotion, their routines marked by the canonical hours, a ceaseless cycle of worship that sanctifies the passage of time. Yet, the medieval church is not an edifice of stone and doctrine alone, but a living community, bound together by the shared rituals of faith. The cycle of the liturgical year, with its feasts and fasts, processions and pilgrimages, marks the rhythm of communal life, imbuing the mundane with a sense of the sacred. Pilgrimages, in particular, offer the faithful a path to redemption and enlightenment, journeys both physical and spiritual that lead to sacred sites where heaven and earth are said to meet. The church also serves as the guardian of morals and manners, a role that brings it into the everyday lives of its flock. Parish priests, the shepherds of their communities, navigate the delicate balance between doctrine and practice, offering counsel, comfort, and chastisement. They preside over the sacraments that mark the milestones of life, baptism, marriage, and last rites, binding the individual's journey to the communal narrative of faith. But the medieval church is also a theatre of the celestial, where the drama of salvation unfolds in liturgy and sacrament, a spectacle of the divine mystery enacted before the eyes of the faithful. The Mass, the central rite of Christian worship, is a profound expression of this drama, a moment when heaven touches earth and the community gathers in a shared experience of the holy. In the interplay of light and shadow within the hallowed walls of churches and cathedrals, amidst the incense and the chants, the medieval soul seeks solace and meaning.
The church, in its myriad forms, from the humblest chapel to the grandest cathedral, offers a vision of order and beauty in a world often filled with uncertainty and strife. It is a vision that transcends the material, pointing to a realm of eternal peace and divine love. Thus, the medieval church emerges as a multifaceted jewel in the crown of medieval society, a complex institution that touches every aspect of life, from the spiritual to the temporal. In its embrace, the medieval world finds identity, purpose, and a sense of belonging to a cosmic order. In exploring the depths of its influence, we uncover not only the foundations of medieval faith and piety, but also the enduring power of the Church to shape the destiny of an age. In the heart of the medieval epoch, amidst the tumult of kingdoms and the fervor of faith, there burgeons a concept so compelling it defines an era, the Age of Chivalry. This is not merely a time of warriors and battles— but an epoch where the ideals of honour, courage and gallantry are enshrined in the very soul of knighthood, a beacon that guides the knightly class in both war and peace. As the sun rises over the realm, casting its golden light upon castles and fields alike, the air thrums with anticipation for the tournament, the stage upon which the chivalric code is both celebrated and contested. Here, under banners fluttering in the breeze, knights clad in gleaming armour prepare to demonstrate their prowess and valour. The tournament is more than a spectacle of combat. It is a ritual, a dance of war, where the bonds of nobility and knighthood are forged and tested. Jousts and melee battles simulate the chaos and glory of warfare, yet they are bound by strict codes of conduct that elevate the contest to a display of noble virtues. But the age of chivalry is also a time of war where the ideals of knighthood face the harsh reality of conflict. The medieval battlefield is a crucible in which the metal of the knight is tested, not just by the strength of arm, but by the adherence to the chivalric code even in the face of death. Wars, crusades, and skirmishes are not merely conflicts over land or faith, but are imbued with a quest for glory and honour, a desire to achieve renown that will echo through the annals of history. The knight, astride his war-horse, becomes the embodiment of the chivalric ideals. His armour, emblazoned with heraldic symbols, is not just protection in battle, but a declaration of identity, lineage, and allegiance. The sword he wields is a symbol of his oath to protect the weak, uphold justice, and serve his lord and lady with unfaltering loyalty. Yet the path of chivalry is fraught with contradictions— for the knight must navigate the delicate balance between the martial virtues of courage and prowess and the softer virtues of compassion and love. In the shadow of the castle, the lady stands as the muse of chivalry, an idealized figure who inspires the knight to greater feats of valor. The courtly love tradition, with its rituals and poetic expressions, adds a layer of mystique and romance to the chivalric code, elevating the knight's pursuit of honour to a divine quest. Yet this idealised love is as much a part of the battlefield as it is of the court, a reminder that the heart of chivalry beats not just in combat, but in the pursuit of a higher, noble love. The fabric of chivalry is woven with tales of legendary heroes, such as King Arthur and his knights of the round table, embodiments of the chivalric ideals in their quest for the Holy Grail. These stories, passed down through generations, serve as both inspiration and caution, exemplars of the noble path, but also of the pitfalls of pride, jealousy and betrayal that can mar the knightly character. Yet the age of chivalry is not an unblemished tale of heroism and virtue. The reality of warfare, with its bloodshed and brutality, often stands in stark contrast to the ideals of chivalry. Sieges and battles, while opportunities for glory, also reveal the darker side of knightly conduct, plunder, cruelty, and the ravages of war that spare neither noble nor commoner. 
This dichotomy between the chivalric ideal and the reality of medieval conflict presents a challenge to the knight, a test of his ability to maintain his honour in a world where the rules of war are often overshadowed by the will to power. As the age of chivalry unfolds, it becomes a mirror reflecting the complexities of medieval society, a world where the lofty ideals of nobility and knighthood are constantly tested by the vicissitudes of life and death. The tournament field and the battlefield are but two arenas where the drama of chivalry is played out, a perpetual struggle between light and shadow in the quest for honour and glory. In exploring the age of chivalry, we delve into the heart of the medieval spirit, a realm where the clash of swords and the whisper of courtly love songs weave a tapestry rich with the hues of valour, love and tragedy. It is a journey into a time when the knight was the paragon of society, a symbol of the high ideals and harsh realities that shaped the medieval world. In the heart of medieval society, where the spiritual and the terrestrial intertwine, art and architecture emerge as sublime expressions of the divine, transcending mere form to touch the very soul of humanity. This is an era when craftsmen and artists, inspired by faith and fueled by the patronage of church and nobility, endeavor to bring heaven closer to earth through their creations. The cathedrals and churches, with their soaring spires and vast naves, are not just buildings, they are sermons in stone and glass, narratives of the sacred designed to uplift the spirit and guide the faithful towards contemplation of the divine. As dawn breaks over a medieval city, its cathedral stands as a beacon of celestial aspiration, its towers reaching skyward as if to grasp the heavens themselves. This is Gothic architecture in its most profound expression, where every arch, window, and sculpture speaks of a longing for the infinite. The play of light through stained glass windows transforms the interior into a kaleidoscope of colour, a visual hymn that narrates the stories of saints and saviours, of creation and redemption. These windows are more than mere decoration. They are a medium through which the divine light enters the sacred space, imbuing it with a sense of the otherworldly. The construction of these architectural marbles is a testament to the ingenuity and perseverance of medieval society. Builders and masons, guided by the principles of sacred geometry, create structures that defy the limitations of their time, innovations in engineering that allow stone to soar and light to dance. The cathedral becomes a symbol of communal identity and spiritual ambition, a project that spans generations, each stone a testament to the collective endeavour of a community united in purpose and faith. Beyond the grandeur of cathedrals, the art of the illuminated manuscript offers a more intimate encounter with the divine. In the quiet seclusion of the scriptorium, monks and scribes labour with quill and ink, transforming vellum into visions of paradise. These manuscripts are not mere texts, but treasures of illumination, where every letter and illustration is imbued with meaning. The intricate initials, the vibrant miniatures, and the delicate marginalia are a confluence of theology and artistry, a sacred dialogue between word and image. In these pages, the spiritual and the aesthetic merge, offering a path to the divine through meditation on the beauty and intricacy of the created world. The influence of the church on art and architecture extends beyond the sacred to shape the secular. Castles and manors reflect the martial and feudal nature of medieval society, but they also incorporate elements of the divine with chapels and oratories that mirror the spiritual aspirations of their inhabitants. In the public spaces of medieval towns, the market cross stands as a symbol of both commerce and faith, a reminder of the omnipresence of the divine in daily life. Yet, the expression of the divine in medieval art and architecture is not confined to grandeur and scale. In the smallest parish church, in the humblest pilgrim's badge, art serves as a conduit to the sacred, a means by which the divine is rendered accessible to all. 
the craftsmanship of a simple crucifix, the weaving of a tapestry, or the carving of a wooden saint, each bears witness to the medieval longing for connection with the divine. As the shadows lengthen and the day draws to a close, the bell tower of the cathedral casts a long shadow over the city, a physical reminder of the church's centrality to medieval life. The art and architecture of the period, in their myriad forms and expressions, continue to speak of a society that sought to manifest the divine in every aspect of its existence. Through these creations, the medieval world reaches out across the centuries, offering insight into a complex interplay of faith, artistry, and human endeavor. In exploring the art and architecture of medieval England, we delve into a realm where the earthly and the heavenly intersect, where human creativity aspires to give form to the ineffable. It is a journey into the heart of a society that, in its quest for the divine, left behind a legacy of beauty and sanctity that continues to inspire and awe. In the mid-14th century, a shadow fell over the medieval world, a darkness so profound and all-consuming that it would forever alter the course of history. This was the Black Death, a pestilence of such virulence that it cut a swath through Europe, leaving despair and devastation in its wake. The plague, arriving on ships from distant lands, found fertile ground in the crowded cities and villages of medieval England, where it ravaged the population without mercy, indiscriminate in its victims, claiming young and old, rich and poor, noble and serf alike. As the plague spread, a palpable terror gripped the heart of medieval society— the very fabric of life seemed to unravel as communities were decimated, families torn apart and social order collapsed. The streets, once bustling with the vibrancy of daily life, grew silent save for the mournful tolling of church bells and the cries of the bereaved. Mass graves, filled to overflowing, bore mute testimony to the scale of the catastrophe as the living struggled to keep pace with the mounting toll of the dead. In the face of this apocalypse, the medieval church found itself both a source of solace and the object of anger. Priests, called upon to administer the last rites and comfort the dying, often fell victim to the plague themselves, leaving their flocks shepherdless in their hour of greatest need. Some saw the plague as divine retribution, a punishment for the sins of humanity, while others questioned a faith that seemed powerless to protect them from such indiscriminate suffering. The impact of the Black Death on medieval society was profound and far-reaching. The staggering loss of life, estimated at between 30 to 50 percent of the population in some areas, led to a labor shortage that would have lasting economic consequences, Serfs, suddenly valuable for their scarcity, found themselves in a position to demand better terms for their labor, a shift that would slowly erode the foundations of the feudal system and pave the way for social change. But the plague was more than a demographic disaster. It was a psychological and spiritual crisis that challenged the very foundations of medieval identity. The omnipresence of death, the mass graves, and the constant mourning cast a pall over the land that no passage of time could fully dispel. Art and literature were transformed by this encounter with mortality, giving rise to a macabre fascination with death that found expression in the dance macabre, a motif that depicted the dead or skeletons leading the living in a dance to the grave, a stark reminder of the universality of death. Yet, even in the shadow of the plague, the resilience of the human spirit endured. Communities rebuilt, fields were sown and harvested once more, and the rhythms of daily life resumed, albeit forever changed by the memory of the plague years. The Black Death forced a re-evaluation of societal norms and values, a questioning of authority and tradition that would sow the seeds of the Renaissance and the Reformation, catalyzing changes that would reshape the medieval world. The legacy of the Black Death in medieval England is a testament to the capacity of humanity to endure in the face of unimaginable adversity, to find meaning in the midst of despair, and to rebuild from the ashes of catastrophe. It is a story of loss and recovery, 
of tragedy and resilience that speaks to the indomitable will to survive and the inexorable drive towards renewal. In exploring the shadow of the plague, we confront not just the horror of the disease itself, but the profound changes it wrought on medieval society, changes that would echo through the ages. The Black Death stands as a dark mirror reflecting the fragility of human life and the enduring strength of the human spirit, a reminder of the power of adversity to transform the world in ways unimaginable. In medieval life, woven with threads of strife and solemnity, the bright hues of feasts and festivals stand out, bringing colour, joy, and a sense of communal unity to the fabric of society. These occasions, marking the passage of seasons and the commemorations of saints, are not merely breaks in the monotony of daily labour, but are essential expressions of cultural identity, social cohesion, and spiritual renewal. In a world where the shadow of hardship looms large, medieval feasts and festivals are beacons of light, illuminating the richness and vibrancy of communal life. As the wheel of the year turns, each season brings its own reasons for celebration, deeply rooted in the agrarian cycle that dictates the rhythm of rural life. In the bleakness of winter, the yule log burns bright against the dark, a symbol of light's triumph over darkness, of warmth amidst the cold. This is a time for gathering, for sharing the bounty of the year past, and for stories that weave magic and mystery into the long nights. Yuletide, with its feasts and merrymaking, is a testament to the enduring human spirit, a defiance of the darkest time of year with light, laughter, and the promise of the returning sun. Spring heralds the rebirth of the land, a time of renewal and hope marked by the celebration of Easter. Here the spiritual and the temporal merge, as the resurrection of Christ is mirrored in the awakening of the earth from its winter slumber. The fields are blessed and the seeds sown in these newly awakened soils are imbued with prayers for a bountiful harvest. Easter is a time of rebirth, not only of the land but of the community, reaffirming the bonds of faith and fellowship that sustain them through the seasons. As summer unfolds, the medieval world celebrates the Feast of May Day, a festival of fertility and renewal that harks back to ancient rites. Villages are awash with colour as flowers and ribbons adorn the maypole, around which dancers weave patterns of connection and continuity. This is a day of joy and liberty, a brief respite from the toil of the fields, where the community comes together in a celebration of life and the lushness of the natural world. The cycle comes to fruition in autumn, with the Harvest Festival, a time of thanksgiving for the bounty of land. It is a moment of communal effort and celebration as the fruits of the year's labour are gathered in. The Harvest is not just a physical gathering, but a spiritual one, where the community gives thanks for the abundance that sustains them, acknowledging the fragile balance between human effort and divine providence. But medieval feasts and festivals are more than celebrations of the agricultural calendar. They are also expressions of social order and hierarchy. The great banquets held by the nobility are spectacles of power and prestige, where the abundance of the table reflects the wealth and status of the host. These occasions are opportunities for display and diplomacy, for alliances to be forged and feuds settled over shared bread and wine. Yet even in the grandest hall, the feast serves as a reminder of the communal nature of medieval society where lord and vassal, knight and squire, are bound by ties of loyalty and mutual obligation. In the public spaces of the village, the festival serves as a leveller, a temporary suspension of the social order where the rules of everyday life are relaxed. Here, the fool may crown himself king for a day and the humblest peasant can jest with the noble in a spirit of carnival that upends the established hierarchy. These moments of inversion and parody are a safety valve for societal tensions, a space where the pressures of feudal obligation and class distinction can be temporarily set aside in favour of shared human experience. 
Yet, beyond the mirth and revelry, medieval feasts and festivals are imbued with a deeper significance. They are a means of marking time, of connecting the present with the past and the future, in a continuous cycle that lends meaning and structure to the human condition. They are a space where the sacred and the profane, the spiritual and the corporeal, intersect, reflecting the complexity and richness of medieval life. In exploring the world of medieval feasts and festivals, we are invited into a realm where joy and sorrow, abundance and want, are woven together in the dance of life. These celebrations are a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, a mirror reflecting the hopes, fears and aspirations of a world both alien and familiar. Through the lens of feasts and festivals, we glimpse the soul of medieval society, vibrant, dynamic, and enduring. As our journey through medieval times draws to a close, we find ourselves standing at the threshold of time, looking back upon a world that is at once alien and familiar. The medieval epoch, with its towering cathedrals and shadowy forests, its knights and peasants, its piety and its plagues, unfolds before us like a vast, intricate mosaic. Each piece, from the grandest castle to the humblest village, from the loftiest ideal of chivalry to the darkest depths of human despair, contributes to the picture of a society complex, multifaceted and profoundly human. In traversing the landscapes of medieval England, we have walked the cobbled streets of history, guided by the ghosts of the past. We have stood upon the battlements of mighty castles, gazing out upon lands contested by kings and barons, where the banners of war fluttered in the wind. We have wandered through the quiet lanes of villages, where the rhythm of the seasons dictated the ebb and flow of daily life, and the community gathered in the shadow of the parish church, a testament to their faith and fellowship. We have witnessed the pageantry of the tournament and the horror of the battlefield, where the ideals of chivalry were both celebrated and betrayed. We have marveled at the soaring arches of cathedrals, where stone and light conspired to create a vision of heaven on earth, and the quiet labor of scribes illuminated the word of God with gold and vibrant hues. Through feast and famine, joy and sorrow, the medieval world has revealed to us the enduring spirit of humanity, striving for meaning and connection in the face of life's impermanence. Yet the journey through medieval England is more than a voyage into the past. It is a mirror in which we might see reflections of our own time. The challenges faced by medieval society, war and peace, justice and oppression, faith and doubt are not so different from those we confront today. The quest for meaning, for belonging, for understanding our place in the cosmos is a timeless endeavor, as relevant now as it was in the shadowed halls of the Middle Ages. In the end, the legacy of medieval England is not simply found in the stones of its buildings or pages of its manuscripts, but in the stories of those who lived, loved, and labored within its bounds. These stories, passed down through generations, serve as a bridge across the ages, a reminder that though the years may separate us from our medieval forebears, the fundamental aspects of the human experience remain unchanged. Love and loss, hope and fear, courage and cowardice, these are the threads that bind us to the past, weaving through the fabric of history to connect us to those who walked the earth before us. In the final analysis, The Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval England is not just a journey through history, but an invitation to reflect on our own place in the continuum of time. It is a call to recognize the common humanity that links us to the past, to appreciate the richness of human culture and the enduring quest for meaning that defines our existence. As we close this chapter of our journey, let us carry forward the spirit of curiosity and wonder that has guided us, a beacon to light our path as we continue to explore the uncharted territories of the past. Thank you for joining us on this enchanting journey through medieval history. While our weekly episodes will continue to captivate your imagination, there's an exclusive treasure trove for subscribers. A secret vault of bonus episodes filled with extra tales, 
and deep dives into the subjects we cover. Your curiosity fuels our mission, and we're truly thankful for your support. Until we meet again among stone walls and towering turrets, keep that torch of curiosity burning bright. Thank you for listening.